Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, hi, I'm Daza Greenwood uh, from MIT Media Lab and also executive director of law.mit.edu, which is the convener of today's workshop, the eighth annual MIT Computational Law Workshop. I just wanna start by saying, having done these things since actually the late 90s at MIT on this topic of law and technology, I honestly believe this is the best program yet. And that's owed largely because of a breakthrough with widely accessible generative artificial intelligence and its applications for law and its impact on law and legal processes. So with that, welcome. And it's by way of introduction, uh, we really look to to Michael and Dan as as um, as pillars in this this emerging space of computational law, um, Dan arguably um, kind of coined the phrase um, b before we started uh, focusing on it at MIT. And Dan, I just want to recognize you again and thank you for being a member of the board of advisors of the MIT Computational Law Report. So with that, can you please show us how on earth you got GPT to pass in part the bar exam? Well, again, greetings from Chicago, and Mike is joining us from uh, from Michigan uh, near the campus of Michigan State University. Uh, I guess um, maybe I can. Uh, well, I'll just keep it here for a second. Maybe I can take you a little bit back back a little bit for us. Uh, you know, we've been working in this area of large language models on the academic side for a while now, and uh, more recently on the commercial side. Uh, um, years ago, we had a company. Uh, called LexPredict, and we did a bunch of things in that company, including things like litigation prediction, contract analytics, and we had a library, and the library, one of the libraries, well, we had several libraries, but one was called LexNLP, and it was focused on, uh, you know, what I think will now be called classic NLP in, in this area, uh, classic NLP, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the historic workflow in which people did undertook NLP tasks, which is now increasingly being displaced by uh, sort of deep learning as the base, uh, as the, the kind of base method. And so, you know, unfortunately, this is just the nature of things. You know, you, the libraries that we built back 2016 to 2018 have been eclipsed by by other mount methods. And uh, so I'd say, you know, you could still use some of what was done before, but I think it's kind of, um, you know, unfortunately fallen by the wayside. So last year, we, on the academic side, we worked with this pan-European group on on something called LexGlue. And this kind of was an opportunity for us to really work heavily. This, this was a benchmark analysis of several le le uh, leading large language models on a wide range of tasks, including BERT, long form or big BERT, so forth and so on. And we got the paper in the ACL conference, which uh, is probably the best conference or one of the best conferences on this topic of, of natural language processing. Um, so in November, when we got out of our non-competes, we, uh, we were once, once born to the breach, uh, uh, we started another company. And so, you know, it was in the context of doing that work. I mean, we're doing a bunch of stuff to build out this company and won't talk too much about that today. But that kind of set the conditions for us to be thinking about, okay, you know, we're building a bunch of these core tools and we've been telling folks, hey, you know, there's been a material increase in the quality of these large language models. And, um, uh, you know, but, but we could not come up with a great way to show that to people. And then, of course, um, November 30th, about seven weeks ago, ChatGPT enters the fold, and uh, you know, uh, 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 and here we are. And here we are. So I was doing this. Uh, I run this this MOOC at a, a Bucerius Law School in Germany, uh, along with some other, with other schools, including SMU in in uh, Singapore. Uh, um, and the very last session, uh, uh, we did this introduction of Richard Suskin using ChatGPT. And we sort of said, okay, you know, I don't, I, giving these intros is always difficult. You know, you want to do the, show sort of the proper amount of fealty uh, and, and what have you. And so uh, we, we said, you know, we're going to outsource this to ChatGPT. And I'll say it gave a pretty high fidelity, uh, uh, a pretty high fidelity uh, uh, um, introduction and, and, and even thanked Richard for, for his presentation. So right before Christmas, I called Mike and I said, I think, I think this is it. I think what we should do is try to do the bar exam. Um, there have been a few efforts, a couple of people had shown a few things online, but I said, you know, we need like a rigorous systematic treatment of this, not just kind of like plug stuff in and see what comes back out. But like, can we kind of go through this in a more systematic manner? And so, you know, we got done with Christmas uh, and we put our heads down and a few days later we had kind of version one and now we're on to the second version um, of the paper. Uh, 
I guess I'd just say this. I mean, uh, 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 language is the coin of the realm in law. And if you had to kind of say, and most roads in law lead to a document. And that document is expressed in natural language from a historical and anytime soon going forward perspective. We have had subsequent waves of legal technology. Most of the, most of the tools uh, have, that have been built to date, including anything we've built and any other tool, and I'll stand by this, really have not had a very good account for legal language. There have been clever hacks to work on these problems kind of in an indirect way, but never a frontal assault on the problem. And the problem is that there's a lot of semantic nuance in legal language, in general language, by the way, and in legal language. And now we've seen this kind of material increase in the quality of tools. And so this kind of brought us a, a, a around to say, OK, can we work on a problem that would help demonstrate to people the nature of the capabilities and the increase in the capabilities? And so we started on the bar exam. So I'm going to pass it over to Mike, and I'll be the uh, I'll be uh, minding the slides to kind of talk us through, but I just wanted to set us up with that. Over to you. So, yep. So uh, we did what you would kind of hope we did, or at least I think it's what you'd hope we did. We went to the source of the exam in any sense, in any sense that there is an exam in a singular correct sense, right? It's the NCBE's model exam. And there's different components to the exam. Some of those are obviously better suited to um, to something like GPT, for example, the MEE or the MPT are probably um, things that GPT could do. They might be things that GPT could even do oh, um, at an adequate or passable level, but we chose the MBE portion in particular because there's not really any degree of subjectivity. It both uh, features complex syntax in the questions, questions that are, if we're being honest, purposely written to trick people, both with the length of the sentences, the complexity of the sentence structure, and the nature of the presentation of the facts, extraneous adjectives, all this kind of stuff. And there's no question as to whether Dan and Mike graded it correctly, right? We don't have access to all these NCBE or state bar graders. And so were we to do the MEE or MPT, there would be questions about whether we had faithfully reproduced an assessment as the actual students sitting for the exam would do. None of those questions for the MBE. So is it only the MBE? Yes. But does that obviously allow us to speak more objectively? Yes. So here's an example of what we got. This is from the um, NCBE's public uh, like documentation about this. We can't reproduce in full all of our questions because they assert copyright, but you can buy them for 200 bucks. And you can see, I think this is, let's see, there are one, two, three. This isn't actually so bad. These are, what, four different sentences here. Sometimes these questions are one to two sentences with that many words. And the question is a, um, a four-part multiple choice question. I'll point out, just to be very pedantic here, the question is asking for a binary answer. But of course, there are not two choices. There's actually four. So the prompt, if read literally, which is what GPT will do sometimes, and some people do, is not really aligned with the question. And this is obviously just a part of dealing with natural language. So while, while if you want to be really pedantic, you'd say the questions are poorly written by the NCBE and, and trick even GPT. It's also just like, this is, this is the way your client's going to speak to you. They're not going to be that precise. So deal with it. Next slide, Dan. So again, to baseline, to talk about the students sitting for this, the uh, rates at which students correctly answer questions are presented in that rightmost column in this table. And if you've ever procured legal services and you're not an attorney who sat for this bar, those numbers might not instill a lot of confidence, right? Like you don't want to know that your counsel forgets Rule 34A um, and uh, gets you into a spoliation situation because they only got 59% on the bar, but that's the way it works. So these are the numbers, quote, to beat if you will, or these at least represent the efforts or abilities of people who spend a lot of time on this. Yeah. Uh, another key point here is ChatGPT is kind of the, the name de jour for what OpenAI offers. Uh, they offer and have offered a number of models. Some of the models are, are multi-modality models that do different things. Some of them just do one thing. Text DaVinci 3 is the best model that we could get to answer the questions. There's also a codex 
uh, model that has got larger token windows and is supposedly better on some tasks, but Text DaVinci 3 was the, the best and largest model that actually responded, which is technically different from ChatGPT as you experience it, but supposedly the foundation. So with that detail aside, we get to the, the meat of this. And I think it was great, um, Megan and, and Daza, you guys talked it a little bit about um, very related concepts, right? So the degree to which the prompt can impact the model's response is in some sense, Megan, like you said, not much different than humans. In many circumstances, the way we frame problems, the, the way that we pose the outcomes, the way that we contextualize which shared body of knowledge, or if there even is a shared body of knowledge, all those things have a huge impact in how we as humans carry on conversations. And we see that with these models. Now we have, I don't know, let's say 70 years of somewhat rigorous psychology that can at least inform human-human interaction. We do not have anywhere near that much longitudinal um, research on how human-computer interaction and these LLMs works. So what we did is try seven things that you might ask a normal student to, to do from a heuristic perspective, helping them take a test, or you might just write questions this way if you've ever written questions as a professor or whatever. So what's the answer? What's the answer with a justification or explanation? then some variation on that with rank ordering two, three choices. In our follow-up work on the CPA exam, we did a little bit more with um, source hallucination and source constraints, which I think you touched on, Daza. But, but for this paper, we just did these seven prompts. And when we uh, did that, as Dan said, we wanted to do this in a very rigorous scientific way, not just like a copy paste a couple bar hero questions kind of thing into, um, into this. So we tried just about every switch and flip and dial that's exposed on the API to ensure that one, the results were robust. This wasn't just like some kind of local optimal API parameter value where it magically worked. So it basically did within six or 7% across every setting that we tried. And, um, and the only thing of note probably here qualitatively is the temperature in some of these parameters have to do with how random or how reliable and deterministic the answers from GPT are. If you're doing anything where you really need to explain what you're doing or cite that you did something at a certain time in a certain way, you should be careful about your temperature values because the only way to deterministically record something to the best of our abilities with GPT is to set the temperature to zero. So we, we tried all these different things. And like I said, the short answer was it didn't really matter. And um, everybody asks, did you fine tune it? Answer was yes, to the extent that we had a couple hundred test questions and no, it didn't help. And no, we don't know exactly why, although we have a lot of theories and there's some other research about how fragile some of these models are. And the question is best answered by just not using GPT, which is something we're working on. So uh, as far as the results, I imagine a lot of you've probably seen it because it's been kind of hard to avoid in the press lately, but I was I didn't believe it at first, right? This is kind of the the short answer because of how hard the problem was and how prior research, even from like Thomson Reuters with a lot of effort, had been, let's just say, not anywhere near close to these. So the the model does worse than the students, but not much worse in a handful of categories. And the model's top two responses are very much correct relative to what it would have gotten if it had been randomly guessing, which suggests it's very close to doing even better than what it's doing right now. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know which section you hated most for those of you who've taken the bar exam or, or those of you who have kind of practical experience with the law, which of these you think you actually still live today. But uh, <laughs> a lot of the questions in the exam are, are difficult. Some are more fact specific. Some involve like information that might be deemed to be outside the scope of what uh, the contextualization, like con law, for example, a bunch of the con law questions have to do with, let's say, foreign relations or, or stuff that, that may have actually been harmed by the contextualization prompts. Um, but it, it did, did better than anyone expected, ourselves included, I think is, it's safe to say. And uh, Dan, if you want to go to the next slide, I think it's clear that Something, sometime, I think we said in the paper, zero to 18 months from when we published will likely meet the threshold for 
the NCBE's kind of estimated passage rate. When that'll be, I don't know. Um, I think I'm leaning towards the under now on that range and not the over based on the acceleration that um, we're all seeing in the market. And I don't know whether you want to talk more about what that means for the bar exam or what that means for attorneys who practice or what that means for, for public policy or what that means for clients. But any and all questions I think are obviously relevant and salient right now and, um, and real questions to ask. Maybe I'll say one thing about this. This was not in the first version we put out. And we thought, you know, it'd be very, we'd kind of done it, but we didn't really, you know, so, you know, it'd be very helpful to, again, we want to show people kind of progress is like, let's just go back and run kind of the historical gambit of GPT models to give people a view that even 2019 and GPT-2, um, which people have used in papers to show like, do things like draft patent applications and things like this, it's not even able to, to process the question. So it's a 0%. Yeah. Then in eight of like one, go ahead. Sorry, Mike. I was just, like, and we've been using some of the commercial stuff like ALN AI models, the Bloom models, all these kind of models out there have been testing for a variety of tests. And the prior generation of models uh, or models that could run on 48 gigs of VRAM before some of the latest 8-bit or compression techniques, like these things were struggling, again, even to respond to the prompt, right? You give a four multiple choice questions with a 500 token intro question, and it just wouldn't even wouldn't even work. So something has materially changed even in the last six to 12 months in terms of the state of the art. I, I feel it too. That's partly why we've dedicated so much of this workshop and why we're gonna be focusing on this through the year. Something big is happening right now. Something has changed. There's been a major breakthrough. I'm so glad you're both on it. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but I just wanna emphasize that point that, hey, everybody, listen up. Things are, this is different than it was even just 12 months ago nine months ago even yeah and i think that this chart is pretty much the proof and i just just uh, show it to you with one other example that um is this this same we have the same result you see in the bottom corner should have made a larger version of the graphic but you see the same story that's the cpa test now it gets clobbered on the math part of the cpa you can read this paper but like but it it's the same basic story you see this material jump between gpt 3.0 and 3.5 bottom left corner as you see it so um okay back over to you mike for anything else or yeah no and i think that the biggest point like if you think about what does the bar exam really test dan as you said earlier it's mostly a test of syntax there's some test of legal theory and and some practical um in the mbe at least that the kind of thing that you at least see in law school and that the state bars care about but but i mean honestly i think a lot of Many practicing attorneys, especially as they lean corporate, care more about the things that are tested in the CPA exam from a, a concept perspective than, let's say, whichever question California decides to throw onto the exam this year. So the, uh, the CPA exam is an interesting semantic or conceptual counterpoint to the syntactic performance of the bar exam. And to me, viewed in, in kind of complement to each other, they show this isn't just a syntax capability quantum leap. This is also a semantic um, conceptual awareness that was also previously not either present or able to be uh, exposed. So there we are. I know, I think I saw a couple questions come in. Yeah, we've got a few. I can help surface them uh, for your convenience. Yeah, do you, do you want to please kind of yeah. pick and choose? By all means. So one one question that's kind of seminal, it's high level, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty, um, is uh, what does this mean for the future of the bar exam? And like if generative AI, let's say in the next revolution or evolution, um, it passes, you know, overall passes the bar. Does that mean that our bar exam or our CPA test should evolve and how? And um, can I just offer one provocation to that, which is, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately when I've been trying to grapple with what does this mean um, and how do we adapt to this uh, and make the most of it, not fall under the bus as well. Um, you know, when, when, when the motor vehicles um, kind of came along, that was a big change, right? But so people could go a lot faster and a lot further that didn't mean we changed the rules of the Olympics for, for running. 
or for a marathon. So we have things that humans do. We have capabilities that machines provide that allow us to extend our reach and our power and our vision in certain ways. But it, it strikes me that the most important thing here is to look at um, look at the technology and not necessarily judge it solely against human intelligence, but let's take a look at it for what it is. Now, having said that, let me ask you guys, what is it and what does it mean for us and for the bar exam? Dan, do you want me to answer because I have less to lose in my faculty? Well, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. I mean, I'm not any big like defender of the bar exam, so go ahead though. Yeah. I think the question is why does it exist, right? And there, there's a degree to which it exists in the absence of a regimented system with transparency and you could talk about things like econ lemon law information or you could just acknowledge that there might be long-standing um, gatekeeping dynamics that are a part of this and that the ncb itself has adjusted the difficulty of the exam solely to reduce passage rates which doesn't strike me as necessarily relevant to the qualification of practitioners if they're just changing it to make it harder so there's fewer people to pass every year I, I don't carry a bar card, so I can kind of say what I want on this front. Um, but I think the question is, again, uh, we said this, I think, in the intro, because I, it's where I truly am on this. There is legal demand. There's kind of a, uh, an, an uncontroversial quantity of legal demand in the market. Lots of people have tried to measure it. Uh, access to justice is kind of existing solely because we don't have either supply or access or whatever whatever kind of lens you want to take, people aren't getting the legal services that they need for one or more reasons. To me, as long as we have this unmet volume, which is not an insubstantial volume of demand for legal mm -hmm. services, especially among people who are probably, if we're being very blunt, not getting access to the best attorneys anyway, then we truly do have an ethical responsibility, regardless of what the hell the state bars tell you, but you have a true ethical responsibility in an absolute sense, to try to figure out how to use these tools to help people. And does that mean give them chat GPT and say, do exactly what it says and, and I'll bill you for it. It absolutely does not mean that, right? Um, but so long as we have so many people who can't afford or access services, the ethical obligation is to figure out how to solve that. And I don't see anything that can scale and get anywhere near as close as what we just presented. Is it ready? No. But is there any other system capable of scaling to the total volume of questions that people ask in our legal systems? Happy to see it. Indeed. And speaking of the total number of questions, uh, we have another um, uh, question here of, of, about what what that what that corpus should be. And the question is, how, how much of GPT Da Vinci's poor performance relates to the lack of the training set? For specific texts in the legal um, context, the judicial it's opinion, and so forth, and and what and what do you think about the next version of GPT um, in terms of maybe um, honing it or uh, doing post training, kind of fine tuning just in this, or if we just make it big enough, will it will it be able to surpass these uh, barriers? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that nobody knows because it's a kind of a closed model, despite the name of the company, is the provenance of the model. So there have been a number of publications that are peer reviewed, although peer review is limited in situations like this. Um, and they say that they're training on a set of data. The best open um, analog we have is called the pile and used in a number of models like the ones from the land community and Bloom. And the pile includes a large volume of material that includes, include but not limited to uh, the free law project and NOLO. And in our CPA paper, for example, we explicitly ask the model to include a source or an authority or a reference to the, to the authority for its answer. And frequently it will show you a URL for something like NOLO or LII or a similar source. And so I am, I've kind of gone back and forth on this as we've collected a little bit more information. I do believe that GPT and many of these models have in them most of the public law, if you will, do they have every complaint in PACER? I don't think so. But do they have most of the public law that you would think would be required to answer these questions? I think the answer is yes. So then it comes down to the 
architecture of the model, what data was used in reinforcement, with what pre-processing or post-processing or other models are in the pipeline that we experience as this singular model. And that for GPT, I don't know how to tell you the answer. I do know the other models out there seem to know about source material. Um, source hallucination is an issue writ large and there's techniques to handle it. And I know you referenced Langchain too, which is a great way to control some of this stuff, but it, um, it, it's an open question, I guess. It depends in, in the most appropriate answer for this community. Well, one, one awesome. thing that should be said though, is that we picked this test because it is not really available on the internet. That's important because otherwise it's sort of your feeding thing it's already seen. So, I mean, obviously there's a concern you do it again, then maybe it's being gobbled up. I mean, this is always an issue, but. Uh, uh, the answers the, for this exam were never sent to GPT. We just took, we only took the answer back. We're trying to keep it clean, but the, but you know, you, you worry with some of the other, there are bar materials out on the web and it's probably been gobbled up in this kind of vacuum cleaner that they use to put in into the file or what have you. So. I, uh, or a common crawl or whatever. Uh, so this, you know, that that was what we were trying to do is we can't because nobody knows absolutely for certain, but this is not generally available on the web. That's that we can say. We're going to need to start to segue. Um, can, I really, I know you're incredibly busy, but I encourage you to stick on for a few more minutes if you can, uh, Michael and Dan, because I, I want to show you, I want you to see what Jesse's come up with in his startup for uh, by way of a, a new modality that lawyers and others can use for, for prompting. And the last little bit of color, um, as uh, Megan and I are in the midst of a research project trying to probe what these models can do vis-a-vis -vis fiduciary duties, one of our thoughts, or one of the things I'm starting to work on with uh, Gabe Tenenbaum and with uh, Jonathan Askin and others is to get um, faculty and experts um, uh, in fiduciary duties to help us come up with completely new uh, fact patterns and cases that have, that have not only not been published, have never been thought of before. So we can really finally have confidence um, that there hasn't been leakage in the training data. That's one of the ways, it's sort of like an extraordinary measure, but at some point we have to just put our foot down and come up and be absolutely sure that we're at least getting performance on things that are novel. We did that with the CPA exam. So maybe we can share that more. We created de novo questions from the curriculum.